that wants to accomplish thing out of great urgency. So, sense of urgency. Uh, I've written a few books. I love doing YouTube. I'm actually writing a new book, so if you Google this, you can find a Google, Google spreadsheet, Google document, where I'm actually writing online, so you can give me instant feedback and grammar corrections or point out stupid things I've missed. So, yeah, so I need to do what I say, like, say, so I have short feedback loops even in my work like that. But today is the topic of teamwork skills. So I'm going to talk about, share my perspective on team dynamics and teamwork skills. But to give you some mental pictures of what I mean when I say awesome team or great, great high performing teams, what does that mean? How do you recognize an awesome team? Well, this is an awesome team. A teams, the new movie, doesn't matter what challenge there is thrown onto, onto them, they conquer everything. And by the end of the episode, there's a silly joke and they move on to the next challenge. Great. This is another great team, at least for many, many, many years. Uh, every single show was full, uh, every single record, so multi-million billion copies. Yeah, and you don't perform like this unless you're in a great team. There's something weird with these two examples. Uh, I don't know if you know, but these are pretend, it's a show. They're not for real. So it's totally unfair to compare yourself to this team. Um, the script writers can make up any challenge and figure out the brilliant way that they conquer the challenge. This is also an unfair comparison because they spend roughly 99% of their time off stage, rehearsing, practicing, re recording the song. It's a software engineer, you're, you're on stage all the time. You write code, you mess it up, you fix it, you launch it, so you're on stage all the time. You, you're kind of supposed to practice as you, you're on the stage. But what about this one? This is uh, the, of the Ocean Race 2014-2016. To do this, to survive the harsh weather and to uh, compete in this competition, you do truly need to be a super strong team with super clear expectations on each other, codes of conduct, how to behave, how do we want to uh, work together, and so on. And uh, of course, they have, do have roles, but they all have to work together as a really super strong team. It's not a great team. But now we're back to unfair comparisons. Sure, they're a great team in the sense that they trust each other with their lives in space. But they practice for five years before they go out. But the, I kind of like this team the best, they're lost in nowhere, and they're trying to get home. This is Star Trek, by the way. And they don't necessarily succeed by always doing what Captain Gainwood tells them to do. They succeed by rebelling, doing what they think is right, helping out, so on. So by being responsible crew members on the ship, taking for the better good of the whole crew, they make it slowly back home. Do, wait a second, do they actually back, get back home by the end of the series? Sort of. Sort of. All right. <coughs> yeah, but isn't this fiction as well? Yeah, no. It is fictional. But I like this mental picture because this is not doing what the captain says. This is doing what's right for the crew, for our, for us to get back home. But to avoid me talking for every single minute of the full hour, I'm going to ask you two pretty tricky questions, or maybe not. But it's a bit uh, the crowd. I don't know. So it's the chicken. So this part. Yeah, I want you to pair up with the person next to you, and I want you to discuss if you have a great team, what are they doing under the hood that you really can't see or touch? So what's the mechanics under the hood that makes them awesome? And I want you to discuss with the friend next to you, let's, let's assume we have a great team, what's observable from an outsider? How can you see, how can you observe that, wow, such an awesome team? So you discuss what's observable, and you discuss what's hidden, and what's happening under the hood. I'm going to shut up for a minute or two. Okay. <laughs>
So, great speed. Yeah, you can see them communicate inside and outside the team, yeah. Just two, two shout-outs. They, yeah, they actually deliver results, you can see the results. More shout-outs. Quality. How do you see quality? Well, you can, right, but... Okay, they know critical bugs in production. Happy customers, yeah. Yeah, they're fierce. Uh, let's do a couple of okay, so these are observable things. Can I have a few examples of mechanics that's happening under the hood? Collaboration between the team. Yeah, We're on the same page. Collaboration in the team. Let's choose the same goal. Striving towards the same goals. People know what the others are doing. Yeah, they're aware of each other's yeah. work and what they're doing, yeah. They can care of each other. Yeah, they can. Well, why is that? They can yell at each other. What why is that? Somebody has to figure things, somebody just jumps in for help. Yeah. It's kind of difficult because he's not kind of waiting for the last minute. Feel safe enough to be honest to each other. What else is going on under the hood? I'm looking for one word here actually. Did I hear trust? Yes. Yeah, yes. But then maybe that's too uh, oh, maybe that's too obvious. But this is my sheet is uh, this is not, it's not black and white, you can argue that some goes should be wrong in the other color. But I think you see they deliver, they're having fun, collaboration, communications, they want their differences, they actually allow each other to yell at each other and so on. But, uh, I've spent a lot of time at Spotify, and instead of just having this vague idea of an awesome team, they've actually, in one of the tribes, in one of the departments, they've spent some time to actually clarify. When we are talking about the wish of having a great team, or when we refer to, now nah, that team is not great, what, what's the opposite then? So we have actually agreed upon, in, in this, the tribe I work with, we are defining that. Uh, some of these are kind of, maybe obvious and simple, so a, a high-performing squad, that's the name of a team, delivers business value iteratively, regularly, and at a sustainable state, or case maybe. They continues to improve, product technology design ways of work themselves, continues to improve, this one are a little bit, maybe not less standard. I, I love the power of this one. A high-performing team, a great awesome team, takes timely, takes timely action based on clear decisions made with shared understanding. There's a lot of things going on there. That takes a while for that to happen within a team. And they also spend time to create 
a psychologically safe environment built on caring and empathy. But this thing doesn't happen by accident, by sheer luck, or by uh, the mastery of a scrum master. I like the way Christopher Avery puts this. Teamwork is not the property, it's a skill. So teamwork is not something that emerges, it's the skills of the individual that will contribute. Of course, you need the environment and support to make it happen. But it actually boils down to how much energy you're willing to put down yourself and how much tools you want to know. And I guess the foundation, one of the one of the foundations is trust. Let's see if I can. fruitful conversations, to commit to results, etc. Et I, I need to trust the person I'm collaborating with, that they want to do a good job, their intentions are good, that they are capable of doing a good job, and if it's not going so well, they're going to reach out and ask for help. And that's easy to do, to build up trust with one, with one friend. Well, if there's three of us, a call is still manageable, I, can, I can, can put in the energy required for me to build trust towards two others, but yeah, you see what's going to happen here, right? So the more people we have to a team, the more problematic it's going to be. And if we're, if we're simply too many, uh, it's just not possible. I, will, I, I won't be able to know every single person that well that I actually do trust every single person. Or trust that I, I'm capable of having a fierce debate with you. We, we've done it before and we always come out agreeing at the end. And that takes a while to build up. So what? Why is this important? Why is this the foundation of trust so important? Uh, have you read the Five Dysfunctions of a Team, the book? It's pretty popular in some management circles. It's a great book, but it, it talks about one thing, and that's um, the Five Dysfunctions of a Team. It's kind of a ladder, and you can read this pyramid in two directions. So one is, for example, if you go bottom up, it says, if we don't trust each other, if we don't trust that we have good intention, and if we don't trust that our ability to have fierce debates and arguments and still be friends afterwards, agreeing upon good things, we will avoid conflict. We will avoid engaging in tough debates and discussions because we simply don't trust that we're able to get out of them with good results. And if we avoid fierce or difficult discussions, well, we won't agree upon a plan or a decision to commit to. And if I haven't agreed upon what we're committing to, I'm not going to bother holding my friends accountable for not living up to that commitment. And if I'm not holding people accountable for doing the best of agreed upon things, well, we're not going to bother about whether or not we're achieving results. So, vice versa, in order for us to really focus on the results, we need to hold, be able to hold each other accountable. Uh, accountable for commitments and promises, and in order to hold each other accountable, we need to reach a state where I feel that you have committed to the same decision as I have. And for order for me to feel that, we're going to probably need to engage in some conflicts now and then. But in order for me to feel I have the energy to engage in those conflicts, I need to have trust in my peers. So that's one way of looking, kind of arguing why the trust is a baseline. And if this happens, I've been to many places where this exists. It comes and goes, of course. And some, you can see, that you can spot. sometimes it's really hard to observe, but on occasions I've actually heard quotes out loud in 
styles like this. Uh, people saying, I get upset when my team members don't do their best or doesn't engage in discussions. Or I expect everyone to listen to the opinions of others. All ideas and opinions are respected. And yeah, so when you hear stuff like that, then, then you kind of build the trust and expectation on each other from commitment and accountability. That doesn't stop here. Uh, if you look at, are you familiar with the Google Aristotle project? I haven't read it all, but I guess I read the popular synapse of it. <laughs> and what they say, what they, what they set out to do was to investigate uh, what factors, how do you create the best team? What's the perfect mixture of people or skills or preconditions and everything? So they surveyed, I think, one whole, over 180 teams over two years. And they did not learn what they expect. They learned that the number one factor for a team's ability to be high performing and successful was the existence of psychological safety. You feel safe to bring yourself. I'm safe to speak my mind. I'm safe. To, I feel safe to be myself and be honest. And vice versa. This, all of these things are important, but according to the study, this was the single one thing. And this also, have you seen the modern agile thing? It's a kind of a, more and more people prefer this way of summarizing Agile over the pretty ancient Agile manifesto. This is just a new version, a new perspective. It kind of says the same thing, you need to dive deep. But they also emphasize make safe a prerequisite. And but they refer to four things. Safety of the service, safety of the workplace, but also psychological safety. Okay, cool, I get it. So, so what can I do to make my team an awesome team? And this is the perspective I'm going to take now. So this is not primarily talk to the manager or HR or the agile coach. This is targeted to you who are a member of the team. So what can I do to make my team awesome? So this is the base point. It's the base point for the rest of this talk is you. So what can I do? Well, one tool to have in the back pocket is the understanding of how a team, team evolves over time. And um, one way to describe this, there are many ways. This way has for me been useful many times. So first, it's described by this guy, Bruce uh, Tucker. First, the team forms. You get together, you're happy. You experience the honeymoon phase. Every, everything is happening, camp and dandy, and we get stuff done. But the backside of that is we have not created a sense of trust and safety yet. So we don't engage in conflict, we don't engage in debates. Everything is very polite and, and shallow. So we have shallow conversations, shallow decisions, and so on. Yeah. But eventually, after a couple of months, depending on the size of the, the team, it could be six months. If it's a super small team, maybe a few weeks. Then we enter something called the storming phase. That's when you actually, the members of the team feel they now can bring themselves to the team they can actually speak their mind and be honest about, about their opinion. And when that happens, people learn that they actually disagree. <laughs> and that they even disagree upon the decisions made here. So all of a sudden, you go from an environment where everyone was happy and the discussions were polite, and all of a sudden there's bad vibe, and you're annoyed at that person that misunderstood you yesterday, and you're annoyed by that, and there's this tension in the room. That's actually progress. It doesn't feel like that. That's progress. <laughs> Uh, eventually, when you sort out your problems and understand each other, and you can find common grounds, then you enter the norming phase. Then you sort out your differences, you've agreed upon long-term strategies, and now finally you focus on the actual work. Awesome, brilliant. Now we're getting bang for the buck, real bang for the buck. And then maybe for a few weeks or a few hours, you can enter the performing stage. I don't know if you're, if you're a developer, once in a while, you get totally lost into the code, and the hours fly by, and you wake up and realize, damn it, it's way past midnight. That's being in the flow, right? So actually, a team can experience a similar thing to that. So why is this important to be able to recognize? First of all, it's super, super hard to recognize which phase you're in, because if you ask a newly born team that existed for one or two months, they're always going to say, yeah, we had a few arguments, so we're definitely norming. Probably not. They haven't, they haven't begun the proper storming yet. So it's, 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 it is tricky to self-assess where you are. But if you can figure out or suspect where you are, the 
you can first of all accept that, okay, cool, we're in a storming, this is not the end of the world, we need to endure this in order to come to a happier place. But it all can also change the way you demand support from the leadership around you, from the scrum master, from the coach, from the manager, the chef the lead. Because for example, if you're in, if you're in a storming, you probably would benefit from more uh, concrete support in the terms of, uh, we have a hard time debating, so can you just please tell us the next goal? We want to know, what, what's, what's the next challenge? Tell us, tell us. So maybe, as a product owner or a leader here, it's the, the proper way is actually to provide the next concrete goal. Uh, to help out to clarify ways of working, team agreements, and arrange tons of social events for to, in order to get people to know each other better. If you feel or suspect you're in the storming mode, don't ask for support, ask for a facilitator. Don't ask the manager, can you come, here, come in here and make a decision for us because we are, we're disagreeing? Ask for the coach, the scrum master, the manager, can you please come in here and facilitate our dialogue? We, have, we need help to talk this through and to come to a strong agreement. Well, in your, if you're into norming, well, then you, then you should probably ask for coaching. Can you coach us? Can you challenge us? Can you uh, set clear expectations? What does success and failure look like from your perspective? So, or we're tired of just taking off the backlog. We want to know why. What's the purpose of this? What's the context? And if you feel that you've been together for a year or two with no major changes and you're really rocking it, then you're going to just going to ask everyone else to just don't come here and mess us up. We're, we're going to ask for help when we need it. Do you, does anyone recognize these faces? Have you gone? I see a few of you smiling. So, but yeah, if you've been through if you've been through a few teams, you will recognize. In retrospect, it's very easy to recognize the different faces. It's way harder when you're in the middle of one. Can you be two? This is a bit, no, not really. Well, sure, it, there's no strict borders, right? So you're transitioning into the storming phase, but it's not storming every single day, but it's under, underneath, and then well, the lines here are probably very, very blurry. Some people ask me sometimes, can one person be here and one here and one here? That perspective doesn't make sense for me. This is kind of a, a collective state of a team. Um, but as soon as you change, as you, you might be moved past storming into norming or forming, as soon as you add a new team member, or you remove a team member, or you dramatically change any of the preconditions, whether you like it or not, you're going to be thrown back into storming. You're going to reevaluate uh, informal leadership, or process, or rules, or you need to find your, if there's a new team member, you socially adjust to, to, to the new puzzle. It's unavoidable, but you can practice recognizing this, and you can practice how uh, the skill to get to move Past it quick. And that's, yeah? You have also an error from the one you started with, but you didn't talk about it. No, no this, if, if the change happens here or here, you, you can revert back. Um, if it's a maturity that, that's been around for a long time, and you have experienced people in the team that have been part of many teams and know the activities you can do, uh, this loop gets shorter and shorter the more people you have in the team that has long experience from being team members. Um, so even if you're just forming into, maybe you're in a reorg and you're being put into teams, the first couple of cycles here is going to be really, really painful. Uh, but for example, I've been working a lot at Spotify. There's so many people, they've been doing team-based team, team work for 10 years from the beginning more or less. So there's a lot of people who know the drill, they understand it, they need to put in the energy and effort to get through this once more, once more. So they build up the skill sets and toolbox to do this. And that's my next step. I'm going to try to give you the toolbox for helping the team you're in become awesome. And I think all of these the take, things apply no matter where you are in this development model. I call it the team success factors. And it includes four dialogues we need to have as a team that I can engage in or initiate. It's three aspects of hard work. And there's two dialogues I need to have with myself. And then there's the final thing, that's our, how we communicate and create expectations to the wide world. So if we look at the first one, please continue to ask questions, otherwise I'm going to keep on talking and showing more slides. So first of all, do we have an inspiring mission? 
do I understand the purpose of why we're here, what we're trying to accomplish? Is, if not, ask that to be clarified. If there's nothing to clarify, put together a workshop and for, formulate your own purpose and your own mission. Because if you, do, come, if you don't know the mission or purpose of the team, how can you possibly decide whether or not this is the team I want to be in long term? And do we have a short-term goal that forces us to collaborate as a team? What's the next? Do we have a uniting sprint goal? Do we have an upcoming release in a month that forces us to collaborate? If not, there's actually nothing requiring you to behave as a team. Sometimes this is tricky to find a goal that might unite the whole team, but at least try. Because without it, there is actually no reason to be a team. Explicit team agreements. If I don't feel that we have verbally and explicitly agreed to uh, how should our process work, how do we, which steps do we do when releasing, what's the conditions, do we have a code of conduct, what's our working agreement, how do we do decision making, and so on. If that's not explicit, it's impossible for me to hold, each other, hold others accountable for their behaviors when they're breaking the rules. And there's a lot of examples, so you can... I'm not saying right piles of documentation step on the point. Make the, the important rules and policies explicit and write them down so you can refer to them. And there's some here regarding process, like releasing or processes or definition of done if you're doing Scrum. But I think, also think the, the working agreement or code of conduct uh, is equally important because of these factors that we've talked about. So in order to build trust, uh, we need to agree upon how we want to behave towards each other. Which, which jokes are okay or not okay, uh, for example. And uh, this is another example from Spotify. Uh, in order to clarify the roles and expectations on each other, they did something called the role expectation mapping. So this was a collaborative exercise where they together projected that we, ex we expect the product owner to do these things, we expect the chapter to do these things, and we summarize that. And this was a series of workshops. But this is one example just of how we can capture expectations or uh, team agreements. And then, you can engage in learning the strength, motivations of others. What's your expertise? What are you, what's your driver? What's your passion? What do you want to learn more of? And actually spend enough time with each other so we start to appreciate that we contribute in different ways. <laughs> I start to appreciate that you're always eager to try something new and you always see things from the problem perspective and you're silent, but when you actually do speak, my God, and those things can be very annoying in the beginning, but by getting to know each other and building trust, I actually appreciate that we contribute in different ways to the solution, to the dialogue. And how do you do this? Well, there's tons of things. Uh, simple things like celebrate together, have fun together, we build pride together social events together as a team, I don't know, party or have a masquerade theme day or stuff like that. Then there's concrete workshops you can do to get to know each other on a personal level. Journal lines, market of skills, moving motivators are all different kinds of exercises you can Google and find. This was a funny thing. I, I worked with a startup in, in, in Iceland, Reykjavik, and they did an uh, a warm-up shaking exercise for the retrospectives uh, that I introduced. Uh, I can explain it. So, hello everyone, welcome team. Uh, write down a number from 1 to 9 on the post-it. Uh, 9 re represents the last few weeks has been awesome. I'm so happy. Uh, life is wonderful and I always long to get back to work. 1 is, I hate my life, I hate it here. If I would have the courage, I would point my finger and resign. Write down your number. One, two, three. Put it on your shelf. Five, seven, five, eight, three, five. And then we took turns, just explaining the number, just sharing. So they love that. But when I come back the next month, half of the teams were doing something called Friday Phoenix. They spend an, an hour every Friday doing this, just to get to know each other. Iceland, yeah. It's weird Iceland people. Uh, all right. And the final dialogue. I can engage in, and, or even initiate, is making sure we as a team have talked enough so that we align on long-term strategies, such as whether we want to have a go with our product, what's our perspective on the future architecture, uh, what is beautiful code, and so on. 
because if I know that we kind of roughly want it in the same direction, I'm more eager to engage in a, uh, in a fierce debate or engage, actually prepare to engage in a conflict because I know we share roughly the same ideas. We just need to hash out the details or we're probably misunderstanding each other. Yeah, so these are four examples of team dialogues. This is talk, <laughs> workshops, meeting. Um, there's more to come. So any questions so far? Does this make sense? Anything weird? So with the uh, Friday feelings, we actually had something similar in Hungary, we just called it feedback, and we like did it all the time to share your feelings, what, what actually happened at the of yesterday with a given person. Yeah. And uh, we thought it was going to be a good idea, but in the end of the day, I personally felt that it may generate even more uh, clashes between the colleagues than could be necessary. So even unnecessary conflict was, was gathered by that. So I'm so you had frequent um, sessions where you met and gave and received feedback towards each other? Yes, so just on one-on-one. One-on-one one -on -one. One -on -one feedback? Yep. And that derailed into the... Okay, it's up to here. So, so it was kind of the same, so that we shared only feelings, yeah. just in small portions, so it was all around the day. All right. And I found out that sometimes it even caused unnecessary conflict between yeah. the So doesn't it cause conflict if you, if you like, know someone has a one and someone has a nine, and it just goes on and on and on for months? What happened? Uh, well, if someone has a, a, a low score for several months in a row, well, you, you have a problem because you're not taking care of your friend. You have a friend that's miserable and you're not taking care of him or her. That's the true problem here. If, if a person shows one and twos for several weeks in a row, that's the true problem. Not that they're having one or twos. Uh, so if that's the case, I think that's sad. Uh, but then but giving and receiving feedback, if, that's the, if that was the exercise, that's giving and receiving feedback both is pretty hard. <laughs> because if we can derail my take on that, for, for, for me to be able to give valuable feedback to you, I need to know what you want. Uh, so what are you striving for? What are, what are your goals? And you're only going to care about the feedback that relates to your work towards those goals or how you want to be perceived. If I come with unrelated feedback, uh, I, I see that's going to create friction. But I have to, yeah. Do you think that happened? Is my feeling that there's actually like personal conflicts involved? No, no, I haven't, I haven't seen it. Uh, I, I've been, I've been, uh, actually, uh, I've seen one, one, and that we just, we just aborted the rest of the meeting and we focused on that. And by the end of the day, uh, that woman got help. And we, that, yeah. So happily, we acted, or the, the leadership acted. Because they weren't aware of the full, how bad she was feeling about this. So that was good. It surfaced. That, of course, it was a shock for the team. A true shock. That's happened once, and I've done this a hundred times. So I, I would, yeah. anything can be real. Um, cool. Let's go on. And then there's, of course, the hard work. And sometimes, I don't know why, but sometimes actually working and delivering together is pretty, pretty hard. So the best, the, the most efficient way to build trust towards your colleagues is to actually find opportunities to collaborate on work, to, to help each other out, solve problems, and code or test or deliver together. A simple way for doing this is, is imposing weak limits. If there's eight people in the team, that's with, uh, limits the work in progress to half, four, that's at least going to force you to pair on work. That's one approach. Uh, instead of doing the round and <laughs> telling the others how busy you were today and how how busy you were yesterday and how you're going to keep yourself busy today and so on. You can do, do the board. So you start with this one and say, okay, these things need to be tested. Who's going to test? Cool, great, thank you. This needs to be reviewed. Who's going to review? So you walk the board instead and drive the work. Mob programming. Have you heard about that? Yeah. How many in here have tried it? No hands. How does it work? Uh, super simple, actually. Uh, there's one person with the keyboard. Uh, he or 
she in this case is, is, the is, the, is the translator of the collective brain. So the others tell her how to solve a problem, and she just captures their ideas into code, and they help out. So she's the yeah. So the other four are the collective brain, and the person behind the keyboard is it's pair programming on steroids. This sounds weird, totally weird, but I, I heard of one team that they said they to try this out for one day. It was super fun. They learned so much from each other, and uh, yeah, you rotate every 15 minutes. So create a safe environment for fail and learn, and they yeah, so much knowledge sharing. And then on the sprint retro, they said, can we try this for a full sprint? Yeah, that's crazy. Okay, let's do it. On, on day, I'm going to come to your question. On day four, one of them just stood up. And, Hello, stop it, This is just silly. There were four, five people here, one keyboard. This is a waste of time. And then they looked at the board of the sprint, and they were almost done with all the tasks that usually takes most more than a sprint to finish. So then they kept at it and six, uh, for six months, I think, until that team was split into two or something. You had a question? Yeah, so uh, you notice some specific kind of problems that is the best for more observations. Okay, that's some uh, specific kind of problems that are great for more programming. No, no, no. 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 Oh, there's so many positive things. If you get over the, this, the craziness of the idea, you learn that you don't have to have meetings. You, you're all in the same room, you don't need data standards, you don't need planning, you're on the board, when you're done with something, you go and talk, you go and discuss the board. So the need for uh, meetings just, that's one thing. And the knowledge sharing happens in, uh, all the time. Quality skyrockets because you have four brains on the same problem, um, finding the most simple, elegant solutions to hard problems. Isn't that about, uh, only some creative tasks that are in the choir of the brainstorming and uh, like collect four? Or because it doesn't make sense for simple tasks or even things? So... Yeah, for one day time. Maybe you're right. I, I, know, I know of teams that do this every single day. I know of other teams who that have no programming Thursdays, for example. So, but yeah, I think you're right, maybe boring tasks. So you see here, they, they have set laptops here. So, so once in a while, uh, someone might uh, investigate something here, and they're quickly testing something here, but the focus is here. Yeah, I'm not gonna get stuck here. Uh, this is a favorite of mine, uh, to encourage uh, team responsibility and teamwork, is that <laughs> you forbid any single person to add work to the sprint. You do Scrap, for example. You're not, no one is allowed to add work. Not the product owner, not the individual. You can't add tasks to the story. You have to add it in the inbox. And we, together as a team, discuss the next morning whether or not this relates to the goal of the sprint. So this becomes kind of a collaborative uh, commitment instead of uh, stuff happening out there. And then we have, uh, we need to engage in gathering, provide, in together so you can provide feedback and its impact on how uh, the impact of our product or service, the quality of what we deliver, and our productivity, and our behaviors. And I'm going to give you a few examples here. Uh, with regards to the impact we make, this is easy to figure out its number of users, or how much money we make, or some kind of built-in uh, net promoter score system, or time to service, if we're more a service department that's helping in providing internal services, how fast can we provide help. But I think the others are more interesting, quality and productivity. Well, one super basic metric for quality is bugs in production. Not bugs found in development, but actual problems in production. That's, I think it's a really simple, if you don't measure the quality today, this is a super simple way to start. Lead time, I don't believe actually there's a really, any really good way to measure productivity. There's, if you do Scrum, you can do velocity and so on, but now it's super hard, so it's so subjective. But this is not. So the number of calendar days from, we have an idea, we put it into backlog, and the number of calendar days until it's in the hands of the user, the lead time, flow through the system. That shows something real and you can't gain it. And then regarding behaviors, um, Spotify does something called Squad Health Shake, so the team, there's a survey, a couple of, two or three times a year, where there's a couple of questions asked how the team is feeling and doing. That's feedback on the support the squad gets, I assume, and then of course we have the 
peer-to-peer feedback, peer -peer feedback. But that it's, doesn't come naturally, it's hard, it's a habit, <laughs> and sometimes it can go sour yeah, if, if delivered or received in an unproductive or unconstructive way. And then finally, how much time do I have? Cool. And then finally, uh, as a team member, you can help out in the rapid experimentation and learning, actively participating in sprint retrospectives, actively trying to uh, navigate through the tough discussions into a strong agreement and then afterwards commit to, to action points. That's, that's truly going to make your team great. But it doesn't only refer to processes, the willingness and courage to experiment on features, ED tests, and so on. Cool. And then there's the really, really tricky part. There's two dialogues you need to have with yourself. At some point in time, after a few weeks or a few months, or maybe sometimes a few years, you're going to have a kind of existential crisis. Is this really fun? Do I really want this? Teamwork is hard. <laughs> there's too many problems. There's too much tech debt and so on. Um, I need to figure out and decide for myself, do I really want to be in this team? Do I really want the team I'm in to be successful? Do I want us to win, to, us to succeed? When you're fresh new, when you're, when you're newly employed at the company, you're totally happy to have joined, there's a new team, you're happy to be part of the team, but eventually, somewhere along the line, you might feel that, mm, wait a second. And this is important, because what happens if you just hang around for the sake of the salary or you just become more and more depressed and the number <laughs> degrades to, to one. Well, your friends in the team is going to notice that. So your passion is slowly degrading, your willingness to be part of the tough debates, to commit to plans, to do all these, all these things, your friends are going to notice that. And they're going to stop trusting you. And and if they can't trust that everyone in the team is as committed as they are, that the team you're in is going to have a way harder time to succeed. So that's one aspect. And the other aspect is, of course, you're being evil towards yourself. <laughs> you're not where you're happy. But that you can change, right? You can always talk to a manager, you change team, or worst case scenario, you found another adventure in another company. Cool. And if you're, if you're a manager and you suspect that someone has not happy, and you're probably not going to win their motivation by incentivizing them with more money. Uh, have you read Daniel Pink's Grind? Yeah. So he has done tons of research and he found that, sure, you, when, when you get a salary raise, you're happy that day and you might brag for it the next day and so on. But what motivates you from a, most people on an everyday basis is autonomy, master, and purpose. Autonomy, uh, my ability to influence what I do. Uh, being able to control and influence the work and who I work with, mastering a chance to, to practice to get better at the things I want to get better at, and purpose, seeing that what I'm doing serves a greater good or helps me in some direction, that's very individual. So, if you're a lab manager and leader and you want to help someone find their motivation, don't start with money, start with these aspects. Okay, cool. I decided for myself I want to be in this team. Then the next tough choice comes. Am I prepared to accept shared responsibility? Do I accept the fact that it, it is as much my job as anyone else to act when things go wrong, when we mess up, to seek opportunities for improvement, to make myself part of the solution as, oppo as opposed to point at the problem, and care for the well-being of, the well of others? That's another choice. All of this requires energy. What you hardest, of course, is a great working environment, being part of a great team and achieving awesome stuff. And then finally, I'm going to wrap up with the final box here. Uh, as a team, we need to get stronger over time to, be, to demand, be better at demanding support and trust from the board, from the leadership around us. So, as you progress through the... In the beginning, you want true support in more of directions and clear expectations. But later on, you want more coaching. So, as a team, you need to get better at demanding delegated power. What is within our mandate to decide and what's not? What's our sphere of decision making and when do we need to consult or agree with others? Uh, how does success or failure look like through the eyes of others from the organization perspective? Because unless we know which, how we're being measured, how can we possibly improve? 
and, the ability, and also demand the ability to form direct partnerships with other teams, other people, other st stakeholders and customers and so on. Ta-da! So this, maybe you notice that this is kind of the agile way you work in a team dynamics condensed. And this map or, or model can be used in a different perspectives, but I think it's having this model in the back pocket as a team member can help you figure out how can I help what should we as a team focus on next? How can I contribute? How can I, what can I do to make my team awesome? So, whoa, whoa. sounds easy. <laughs> well, actually, no. Because all of these things requires debate and hard work, and that's going to cause friction and irritation and bored people or angry people and so on. And why is that? Well, let me tell you why. That's because you frequently have to go through something called the grown zone. So, whenever we engage in a discussion, we start with a problem, a topic, a decision to be made, and we hope that by making some conversation and workshops and post-its, we'll find a way to an outcome, a decision. Cool. The problem is that when working in a team, in software and engineering, we have, first of all, quite often complex problems, but that's not what makes the discussion hard, it's that <laughs> there's many people involved and every, every person brings different needs and different perspectives and different opinions and strong beliefs of what works and doesn't work. So it's really, really hard to reach a really strong outcome where everyone feels included, it's a win-win, everyone leads with strong commitment and the path forward is super clear. And why, why, is, um, skip here. why is that? Well, at the beginning of a dialogue we explore options, we gather data, and then at some point we start to figure out which option or decision should we take, so we finally end up with one strong one. But what happens in between here is something called the grown zone. That's when we're misunderstanding each other, talking past each other's head, just repeating our own arguments. And why is that? There's, not, there's no way around this either. What usually happens in the beginning, when you enter a dialogue, this is what happens. <laughs> I, the only thing you're thinking about is, I'm not listening to you. All I'm doing is I'm thinking about how my need to present my arguments in a convincing way kind of overrules my ability to listen to what anyone else is saying. I'm just thinking of uh, how can I formulate my next argument in a better way. But by the end of the grown zone, when everyone has a chance to be listened to and heard, and we actually understand each other, then not only do I understand each other, but I now trust that since you understand my needs and problems, I trust that whenever you propose something new, that proposal includes my needs and my concerns. And this can take a while. And why is that? Can I ask you to stand up? So we're going to simulate this. Why is it so hard to listen and talk at the same time? Can I ask you to stand up? Can I ask you to help me? Just going to do a silly, silly exercise to get some energy. This is the final thing I'm wrapping up soon. Um, so, the beginning of the grown zone, where we have competing trends or reference, where we're talking and thinking at the same time. This is kind of what going, goes on. So we're, all we're going to do, so pair up with the person, so form pairs, uh, and we're simply going to count to three together. So, so Dennis, and, so just imitate me and Dennis. Okay. So one, one, two, three, four, five, you get it, right?
trying to actively listen and think at the same time. And I don't know why, but obviously for sad evolutionary reasons we're incapable of doing that. So when we're in the grown zone, when we're debating, this is happening. I'm trying to present, present my arguments while at the same time kind of listening to you, but really not. And that, that can go on for quite a while. And if it's a really tough problem with many people, you're going to experience frustration, that people, no one understands you. Boredom, like, hey, yeah, can everyone just move on and so on. So you have all these feelings going on. That's science that you're in the grow zone. But endure that, that's another skill. So what you can do to help your sheep get through this is to be patient. It sometimes takes time to disagree before you find a way path forward. Listen first, because if you feel that I have listened to your perspective and your arguments, then you can, <laughs> cool, and then you come back, okay, so Jimmy, so what's your perspective? So once you feel listened to, uh, then it's easier to listen to others. Tolerance for these feelings. Don't accept violent behavior, but kind of be tolerant that people will experience boredom, frustration, and so on when there's fierce things. Maybe take a break and be perseverance. Have, that be per per have perseverance. Because the more important it is that everyone agrees, the more danger comes with importing this growth. So, in conclusion, <laughs> I showed you this model. If you want to, there's a YouTube video and a blog post describing it. And if you want to read more books, here's a couple of books that inspired myself and part of this talk. If I have a nervous audience, for example, and I said, no, no, we're going to play a game up here, I need 10 volunteers, and not a single person stands up, then I can simply say, well, hello, people, you have a problem. <laughs> uh, we're not moving anywhere without 10 of you volunteering. So you can have the same, you can just have, have patience, the, the power of silence. So who's going to talk? Everyone's going to hear you say it. Just wait. Wait and wait. Or turn a pen. This is going to start talking. Or give people time to think individually by writing post its That's probably the best approach. So, okay, cool. Okay, no one is talking, but I can see you are thinking about something. I can see you are thinking about something. By the way, you can lie when you say that. <laughs> I see you're thinking, I see you're thinking. So, please write it down on the post it. And then we share. So, tricks like that. Uh, Sorry? Probably yeah. <laughs> you pass the ball, yeah? <laughs> I think this is usually is a problem for newly formed teams. Teams have been around for a while. They know that some of some are shy and some are very, very, very vocal, but they find ways to balance that out. But again, it's a common problem when you have a new newly formed team. We're in the form forming stage. Any other questions? Uh, more thoughts. Can you go really back like, to the ground that yeah, one more? Because a lot of times it happens that you come to these meetings with all these problems, yeah. and then you go into the ground zone, and then you say, you never end up coming out of the meeting yeah. with options and... Yeah. So, uh, what, what is happening then? Probably there's a lot of people in the room that uh, share different perspectives of things and so on. I think that's that's when you truly, that's when you, if you have a great facilitator to call for help, that's when he or she can really make a huge difference by shaping the dialogue, creating a structure to the confusion, hashing out options, providing a framework or a workshop format for evaluating each and every one of them. Uh, so yeah, uh, one trick might be to well, first of all, take a break. Let's say, no, come back in 15 minutes, and then please, during those 15 minutes, individually reflect on why this is hard for us. So 
and then we come back and then we share why it's so hard for us to find agreements, and that might surface underlying conflicts or misunderstandings, and it might shoot off in that direction. Another approach could be, let's say you have three options forward, and you end up just defending your favorite, and again, take a break, and then come back, and then you say, okay, fine. hello, everyone. Let's together argue why A is the best option. We're going to do that for 20 minutes. Next 20 minutes, we're going to argue why B is the best option together. I'm going to force all of you to have a say in this because you, there's great things and everything, so let's help out here. And then C, let's help out all together look in the same direction. So we just focus the group in one single direction and, and enforce empathy and putting yourself into the shoes of others. But this, this is a this is a skill in itself to it's never it's rarely this dramatic as I described it. But sometimes it is. And I've been into yeah, I've been to, to my me my the consultant consultant company I work with in Stockholm, Chris. There's forty of us and we don't have a single manager. So we govern our own business. So we meet together twice a year for a two day conference. We only do open space. Uh, and we make all decisions by uh, consensus, consent. <laughs> so, once, <laughs> so we can't, we can't just ask, hello, president or manager, make the call for us. It's a tie. It doesn't work for us. So we need to actually find agreement. And I've been to one conference and did our ground zone lasted for 20 hours straight, more or less. So all first day, all through the evening, and then halfway through the other day. So that's an extreme. Usually it takes. Sometimes it just goes away, goes over, takes a few minutes. Sometimes a few hours, and you might need to break and come back to it later. But then you have the experience, right? One way is, of course, to reduce the number of people. So cool. The 10 of us obviously can't find a way forward. Can we some way figure out which five of us needs to be here together and allow them to make a decision for the rest of us? Oh, there's so many. It's a whole other topic. Can I, as a final exercise, can I ask you to turn to another person next to you and just share with that person what, if anything, do you, will you take with you back home from this hour? So, did you find a piece of golden nugget somewhere here that made sense and felt valuable? I'm never going to wrap up. <laughs>